Well, good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, grab your Bible. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. We will be reading verses 13 through 17 this morning. We are nearly finished, nearly through with the book of 1 John, nearly finished with our sermon series, Blessed Assurance, on this uh, book of the Bible. And as we near the end of this book, we come across a purpose statement. Why John wrote what he wrote to these Christians. And by extension, why he wrote what he wrote so that when we read, we similarly may be blessed as Christians. Let's read 1 John 5, verses 13 through 17. Hear now the word of the true and living God. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that He that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Let us pray. Once more, Father, our brother John has written some things that are challenging to us. So we pray that you would give us Holy Spirit wisdom, that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can understand the things that are recorded in sacred Scripture, and that we would in turn apply these things to our lives. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a casual reading of the Gospel of John. And then the epistle of John will demonstrate that there is undoubtedly a difference in the purpose of the gospel and the purpose of this epistle. If you will recall the end of John's gospel, John chapter 20 and verse 31, Verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20 of John's Gospel give us the purpose statement for the Gospel. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. The purpose of the Gospel was to produce faith in those who read it. The purpose of this epistle, 1 John, we read just a moment ago, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. First John was written to provide assurance, hence the title of this sermon series, Blessed Assurance. We are blessed with the assurance that we have eternal life because we believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, this text, no doubt, as you as we were reading through it, presents a, a couple of different challenges for us. You have the bit here about prayer that is written, and, and we can ask God anything. And well, we, we need to dig into that a little bit. But then also you had this business of sin unto death and sin not unto death. That's literally what John writes there. Sin unto death, sin not unto death. You've got to dig into that too to see what it is John is communicating there. But first, let's, let's just relish in the glory of the knowledge that we have eternal life. Verse 13, I write, I have written, could also it could be translated that way. I've written these things. What things? I think it's the sum total of this epistle. It goes all the way back to chapter 1 and walk in the light and, and how uh, we, we possess the truth and how we are to love one another, and how we love God as well, and how we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and and all these things that John has written 
He says, I've written these things to you, you, you who believe in the name of the Son of God. These are Christians, in other words, that John is writing to. These are believers. I've written these things to you believers, you Christians, that you believe, by the way, in the name of the Son of God. John is very specific here. The name would have captured the whole essence of the person. And so our faith is rightly placed in the whole person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. Again, John has been very careful to identify who Jesus is. He's, he's carefully uh, written in, in some detail about the precise identity of who Jesus is. The Jesus that John knew is the Lord Jesus, the Christ, who is the Son of God. And that's important because there were those who were denying vital aspects of the identity of Christ. John says you can't do that and, and maintain the same gospel. You start uh, deleting certain aspects of the identity of Christ, and you are then distorting the gospel. And so John, he's been very careful about that. And, and by the way, um, these Christians back then, they believed in the name of the Son of God. We do too, Right? We believe in the name of the Son of God. And so this promise here is good for us also. I write these things so that you may know knowledge. This is, this is uh, uh, deep knowledge. It's, it's rooted knowledge that John is getting at here. Uh, and we can know this for certain. What can we know? That you have eternal life. And we've spent time... Uh, we spent time last week unpacking the significance of possessing eternal life. And I know there are some, even in our fellowship, who would point to the fact, well, what this is really pointing to is, is the prospect and the promise of eternal life. We don't necessarily have it now. But that just goes against everything that John is writing here and the way that it is written. We presently, currently, right now, possess eternal life with the definite promise and prospect that there is more in store then and there. We must not lose sight of the fact we have it right now. And we can enjoy this eternal life in the here and the now. And we ought to enjoy this eternal life. It is a glorious thing to live life with God. And that's what John has been pointing to all throughout this. It's tied to fellowship language, how we have fellowship with God because of what Jesus has done. And now he says, yes, and we can know that we have this eternal life. That is indeed blessed assurance. We continue to possess and have real, eternal life with God. Just sit with that for a moment. And the beauty and the glory that goes along with that. Indeed, one of the results of the assurance of this eternal life is confident intercessory prayer. This, verse 14, and this is the confidence, your translation may say boldness, that's good too, the confidence that we have toward Him. Don't, don't look past that, by the way. That, that language of toward Him, that is presence language. You, it's as if you're face to face with God. It's the same, uh, the same thing that John wrote earlier back in chapter 3 and verse 21, and we highlighted it there as well. 321 of 1 John, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. That is in His presence. It's the same word, uh, the same kind of structure that you get at the beginning of John's Gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word uh, was God. But that phrase there, the Word was with God. That is, again, the same structure. The Word was before God, was in the presence of God, which, again, highlights the distinction between the Father and the Son. By the way, because we know the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that's the Son. God there, God the Father. And so distinct personalities within the Godhead, and yet co-equal with one another because the Word was God. What, the word, what God was, the Word was as well. Okay? That same language is used here where we have confidence toward Him, before Him, in His presence. You see, that's what prayer is, by the way. He's going to talk about prayer here in a moment. Prayer 
is going into the presence of God and just speaking with Him, talking with Him. And you can do that anytime. You can do that anywhere, all right? Uh, all throughout your, your daily walk with God, you can live life in the very presence of God. Again, what a marvelous blessing. Uh, what a glorious confidence that we have, that we can uh, come before Him, and that if we ask Him anything, ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now, that's a very significant qualifier, that, uh, that, that phrase, according to His will. And it's shown up already in John's Gospel, excuse me, in, in 1 John, I should say, the epistle. Go back to 3, 21 and 22. We read verse 21 about having confidence before Him. And again, John makes the connection here to prayer in verse 22 of 1 John 3. He says, whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. God's will for us, brothers and sisters, is right here. Keep His commandments. We've already seen His commandments are not burdensome and do what pleases God. You see, I think that's what this phrase, according to His will, is speaking to. It's not a, a restriction before God uh, concerning our prayers, but rather it is qualifying the way that we live. It, it points to a qualification for the children of God, that you are living according to the will of God, and therefore, of course, you can ask Him anything because you're His child. And you demonstrate that in your walk. Notice also that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He hears us. We have the Father's ear as His children. And He delights in hearing from His children. He hears us. And in connection with that, uh, He answers that prayer. Now, does He give us everything that we ask of Him? Well, it's again, it pertains to that father-child relationship. You know, my, my children ask me for lots of stuff. Not everything they ask for is good for them. Uh, can, can, I have, uh, can I have these Pop-Tarts in addition to the ice cream that I'm having for dessert? No, son, you, you can't do that. You, you got to pick one. And pop tarts, I mean, they, they claim to be breakfast food, but they are kind of a dessert, aren't they? But anyway, not everything they ask for is, is something I'm going to give them because not everything they ask for is good for them in a similar way. Our Father, who is the best Father of all, knows exactly what we need before we even ask it. And so, you know, when you ask for that solid gold Cadillac in your driveway, well, is that really needful and is that really good for you? And so, I suppose you can ask of it. But in fact, a sanctified heart who desires to do the Father's will and to know the Father's will is typically going to ask, not my will, but your will be done. Don't we have that example from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself? The Son, capital S, of God? So ask, yes, ask Him anything according to His will. And He does hear us. He really does. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. And again, uh, we've asked, we, we, and, and the force here is you continue to ask. You continue to bring it before God. Uh, in fact, Jesus, he told a parable along these lines in, in Luke chapter 18 uh, about the persistent widow. Uh, listen to this parable that Jesus told in Luke 18, beginning in verse 1. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual 
coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So here's this parable. And again, it's a lesser to greater argument. The lesser is this unrighteous judge who, because of this persistent widow, finally gives in. Our Father is infinitely greater than an unjust judge. Indeed, He is the just and righteous one. And so will He not give us justice in that context? And here, John is talking about our requests that we have asked of Him and that we have continually brought before Him. What kind of requests are we talking about here? And again, contextually, John is not talking about solid gold Cadillacs and all the other extraneous things that we may think about. By the way, this is a text that is often abused by Christians today, by the name and acclaim it, the, the blab it and grab it crew, the prosperity gospel folks, uh, will lean into this text and say, see, you, you just got to have faith and God's going to give you everything you ask for. No, sometimes he says no, and for good reason. Sometimes he says, you got to wait a minute. Sometimes he says, yes, right, right away. Sometimes he says, I'm going to give you something even better, something greater than that. What is the context for these verses of prayer? The context is intercessory prayer. Notice verse 16. Here's the case study. And and it's as if John is leaning into a similar style that he had earlier in the epistle. Remember uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, he says, if we say, if we say, and and he, he presented these examples. Well, that's what he's doing here in the context of this confidence that we have before God in prayer and asking Him concerning our brothers. Notice, if anyone says, excuse me, if anyone sees his brother, it's that if anyone that seems to clue us into, ah, oh, this is kind of a, this is like a formula statement where John is presenting this case study for our consideration. If anyone, the anyone here, by the way, would be any Christian, because that's the context. It is Christians who have the ear of God the Father. And so here is a Christian, and he sees his brother. Don't look past that. This is a fellow Christian that uh, this this brother sees. This is his brother seeing a brother committing a sin. Notice the sin is observable, and it's identifiable, which, by the way, stands in stark contrast with our present secular society that is all about, don't judge me, right? Right? Well, no, if, if sin is sin and, and we see it, it's observable, it's identifiable, then we need to call it what it is. It is sin. It is, well, John's going to give us a brief definition here uh, in verse 17, where all wrongdoing is sin. So you see your brother and he's doing wrong. He's sinning. But notice the, the sin that he is committing uh, is a sin not unto death. He is sinning a sin not unto death. That's the force of what John writes here. Sinning a sin not unto death. Hmm. So, first of all, we've got to recognize he's still a brother. Okay? Um, fellowship exists. There's relationship here. And there is apparently some kind of Habitual practice here because it is he's sinning a sin that needs correction. In other words, this brother or sister's sanctification is not yet complete. And there is a noticeable wrongdoing, a noticeable shortcoming, a noticeable sin that needs to be corrected. You understand, that's why God gave us one another. is so that we can help one another get to heaven... And part of that journey is, my brother, my sister, this is not in accordance with God's will. And the way this is phrased here, it's a sin not unto death. How are we to understand that? And especially as you come down here into the rest of verse 16, and John says there is sin that leads to death. There is sin unto death. What's that? Well, in the context of 1 John, if this is a brother, then this is a believer 
who is, to go all the way back to chapter 1, doing his dead level best to walk in the light as he is in the light. But there is some wrongdoing, some sin that needs to be abandoned because sanctification doesn't, doesn't just happen all at once. It's a lifelong process. And so here, I don't know how long they've been a Christian. Maybe it's been for a short while. Maybe it's been for a long time. But they, it comes to the attention of a fellow Christian, oh, what they're doing is not in accordance with what God has revealed in His Word. This is a, a, a Christian who is, again, doing their dead level best to walk in the light as God is in the light. But they have some area of their life where they are coming up short. And so it behooves this Christian to come and to address their brother, their sister. Go to them on a one-to-one basis and call them to the high and holy calling to which they've been called. I know there are a number of different ways in which this sin unto death has been interpreted. There are those who want to dig into the law and make distinctions between the, which are, exist between laws that, uh, uh, sins that are committed uh, unwillingly, unknowingly, and sins that are committed deliberately. I think that is a category that John doesn't deal with, though. That is foreign to the context of 1 John. There are those, and, and especially from our Catholic friends, who would make a distinction here between venial and mortal sins. Uh, and so, you know, there are some sins which are more severe than others. I think that's accurate, but uh, this category of venial versus mortal sin, Scripture knows nothing of that. But again, there's a t- an attempt to read that into this. There are those who want to make the connection between sin and a death and blasphemy the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. But again, all of these are categories that are read into 1 John. John's categories are, you know, there are believers and unbelievers. And a believer is one who is walking in the light. They possess the truth. They are loving their brothers and sisters. They are loving God. They are uh, confessing Christ. But there's an acknowledgement that we're imperfect. You see, if anyone does sin, and we do, remember this from chapter 2? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. The unbeliever, on the other hand, is walking in darkness. And they don't possess truth, they possess falsehood. They hate the church, they hate God, and they deny Christ. I think that's the difference here. The sin not unto death is a sin committed by a believer who's doing his dead level best to walk in the light and hold to the truth and love the church and love God and and confess Christ. But they're coming up short in this area. Their sanctification is not complete, in other words. And it won't be until we get to glory. That's the sin unto death. That's what this brother sees his brother committing. That is what you're to pray for. He shall ask. The anyone shall ask on behalf of his brother. He shall intercede for his brother or his sister. And literally what John writes here is, he he shall ask and he will give him life. And my English standard gives the interpretation here of God will give him life. And I think that's right because God is the source of life. He will grant renewal to this brother or this sister. Uh, He will uh, give To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, He will give them life. Uh, And again, that's the renewal. That's the the, the renewed life uh, that uh, comes with confessing sin before God. The help that only God can give. That's the distinction here. I think that's an accurate contextual reading of the sin not unto death. Again, does it give us license, all the all income free, do whatever you want? No, no, not at all. Uh, but rather, it gives us direction in terms of how we are to relate to one another as Christians. It is similar to the instruction that is given by Christ in Matthew chapter 18. John, the apostle, would have been privy to that instruction about if a brother sins against you, verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18. By the way, Verses 15 through 20 of Matthew chapter 18 is a church discipline context. And you know, what's at the heart of discipline is a disciple. It is a disciple who doesn't flee from discipline, but rejoices in the correction. 
that a, a brother brings to them. Notice, again, if your brother sins against you. Again, this is the context of the church. You go to him, tell him his fault. T- tell him where he has sinned. Between you and him alone, one to one. My brother, my sister, I love you. I love that you love Christ. I love that you love God. I love that you are doing your dead level best to live according to God's Word. At the same time, I saw, I noticed, I see in your life, there's this that is not conforming to what God has said in His Word. And my brother, my sister, repent. Sometimes it's the scalpel that we need. We need to be, we need the careful cutting. John, though, also recognized sometimes you need the hacksaw and, and you need the serrated edge. Uh, and, and especially the, the false teachers who are coming and they are denying Christ and they are distorting the gospel and distorting the identity. That's when you need, uh, my friend, you are distorting the gospel. You are demonstrating that you are not faithful to Christ. You do not have loyalty to Him. You need to repent. You're a false teacher with this. See the difference? It is wisdom that is able to discern the distinction in those contexts. There's further procedure. Look, uh, the rest of verse 15 of Matthew 18. If he listens to you, and that's the best possible scenario, mm, cut to the heart. Cut to the quick. You know what, brother, sister, you're right. You're right. That What I've been doing does not conform with this. And I need to change my thinking. I need to change my behavior. And I need to bring my life in conformity with God's Word. If He listens to you, you have gained your brother. And all of, rejoice, all of heaven rejoices with you over the repentance of a brother, a sister. But if He does not listen to you, that's verse 16. I preached this sermon before, and there's a lot to be said about this, but there is a specific procedure that Jesus outlines concerning how you deal with an unrepentant brother or sister. The next step is you need two or three witnesses. And it's not, you, you, hey, uh, hey, uh, Gary and Gary and Mike, come with me. We've got to go attack our brother, right? Because he's in the wrong. The two or three witnesses come together and you tell your side of things and your brother tells his side of things, and the witnesses determine, um, you know what, Nick, I think you're, I think you're making a, a mountain out of a molehill here, and there's really nothing here. Or, you know what, uh, Nick is right, and brother, sister, you do need to repent. When are you going to repent? And if they listen, you've gained your brother. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, having heard the testimony, having heard the case, and having determined the verdict, that's when you go to the church. Brothers, sisters, we have a brother or a sister who is in rebellion to God. They refuse to repent. And the church is never more united than when they beat a pathway to that brother, that sister's door. When are you going to repent? When you see them out and about, brother, sister, when when are you going to repent? That's the conversation that needs to be had with the rebel. It's the only conversation to be had, by the way. Because we're out of fellowship here. It's a fellowship thing. And if he does not listen to the church, that's when you treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector. Again, a lot more to be said about that. But what I see John communicating here is that first step. You see your brother? Go to him. That's, that's, we're family. We ought to be able to, to call one another to account for this stuff with gentleness, with respect, with love, because we love the church and we love our brothers and sisters and we love God, right? That's what John is communicating here. It is also similar to, uh, come with me to the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, this is where Philip has gone to Samaria. And I mean, the gospel is doing marvelous things among the Samaritans. A bunch of people are hearing the gospel. They're uh, being baptized. They're being obedient to, to God and to Christ, including this guy named Simon. Simon is a magician who apparently is, is wanting to cling to a part of his life, his former life. 
And Simon is seeing the, the incredible things that are being done by the apostles, and he wants to buy that gift with money. Hey, I've, I've got some silver here, and uh, the apostles have come up from Jerusalem. Uh, give me this power. This is verse 19 of Acts chapter 8. Give me this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands can receive the Holy Spirit. And notice Peter's response to him, verse 20. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Here's a brother calling his brother to account because of sin. You, Verse 21, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Repentance. When are you going to repent? For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And it's only Christ who can break those chains. And so what does Simon do here? Verse 24, he answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Pray. Intercede on my behalf. What is it that John is saying here in 1 John chapter 5? You see this, and you look to the Lord for correction. Pray. He shall ask. Again, that's the context. That's intercessory prayer here. Ask Him anything. Specifically, we're talking about intercessory prayer on behalf of your brother or your sister who is sinning a sin not unto death. And then this is where it gets very sobering. Because John says that there is sin unto death. And the sin that is committed unto death seems to be, again, the sin that is committed by an unbeliever who is walking in darkness and possesses falsehood and hates the church and hates God and is denying Christ. John says, I, I'm not saying, I do not say that you should pray for that. You don't pray for that. This reminds me of the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, the, the, the weeping prophet, he is, he is the, a prophet that witnesses the, the people of Israel right before Babylonian captivity. In fact, it is during his lifetime that, lifetime that Babylon comes and hauls uh, the, the people of God off into exile over in Babylon. Three different times in this book, you have the Lord instructing Jeremiah, verse uh, chapter 7 and verse 16. Notice this in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 16. God says, as for you, do not pray for this people. This people who are in rebellion against God, who are all caught up in their sins, who are disloyal to the covenant, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or a prayer for them, and do not intercede with me. For I will not hear you. I'm not going to hear this prayer for the, this sin that is unto death. Wow. Uh, he says this, repeats it again in chapter 11. In verse 14, therefore do not pray for this, this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. And then chapter 14 and verse 11, the Lord Yahweh said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Don't pray for this. And here's, that's what I think of when I hear John saying here, there's sin unto death. I'm not saying you should pray for that. In fact, we shouldn't be praying for that. Again, very sobering here. Fellowship does not exist between uh, this individual and God. Their, again, their sin is unto death. Their, their sin is not covered by the blood of Christ, uh, and, and they are in open rebellion to God. Uh, don't pray for that sin. Verse 17 gives us a, a brief theology of sin. Where he says, all wrongdoing is sin. And uh, he, John, had made a similar statement earlier in chapter 3 and verse 4 about sin. 
1 John 3, 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And now here is, all wrongdoing is sin. Uh, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Still wrong. Needs to be repented of. It's not unto death. Because again, this is sin that is committed by a believer who is under the blood of Christ and uh, who, when, when it is brought to their attention, will be one who, of course, the sanctified heart will repent, will be convicted, and will turn to the Lord for healing and for life. The one who is sinning a sin unto death, or is sinning sin unto death, the, the call remains that they need to re- repent and believe the gospel. They need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, they, they need the gospel. Uh, and so that is what we owe the unbeliever, is the gospel. To share the gospel, preach the gospel, to tell them about Christ, so that they can find life when they are currently unto death and under death. Indeed, biblically, it is John who records that the wrath of God abides on the disobedient one presently, right now. And it is our commission to, as we preach the gospel, to share with people, flee from the wrath of God. But for our brothers and our sisters, who have eternal life, we also owe them the courage to confront, again, with love, and to call them to the high and holy calling to which they uh, have made a commitment and a confession to. But all this is rooted in, again, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is because of Him that we have eternal life. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's the best news these sinful leaders ever heard. That we have eternal life. Not because of anything we've done. Not because we're smarter, or more spiritual, or uh, we were uh, able to crack the, the lockbox of faith and, and on our own, in our own abilities and skills. No, no, no. It's all because of God and what He has accomplished in Christ Jesus. That all of our sin has been dealt with at the cross. That all of Our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. And we continue to experience the cleansing flow of that blood upon us. And again, it flows from Calvary. Let's commit this to prayer. Lord God, we pray that for the the sin in our life, that You would expose it as utterly sinful to us and that we would seek to abandon it. Indeed, Father, we pray that through Your church You would help us. That through our brothers and sisters, with love and by faith, these uh, sins would be identified and our, our, our progress and sanctification would be made more perfect. I pray, Father, that we would indeed be people of humility, knowing just how much we've been forgiven. And that we would be of such a mind that indeed we enjoy life with You in the here and the now. That we would enjoy this life with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that in in similar fashion, we would enjoy life with one another. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen.